Thank you very much, Dr. O, and thank you for uh, your kind consideration of a change of schedule. <clears throat> what I'd like to do over the next 20 minutes or so is talk about percutaneous mechanical support devices. It was interesting to me to hear Dr. Kyung Hee Kim say that the use of ECMO prior to transplant worsened the long-term outcome. And it would be interesting to know, is that, is that a cause and effect, or is that a selection of high-risk patients beforehand? I am at the Drexel University College of Medicine in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in the United States. Here's our mascot, a Drexel dragon. We have a big statue in front of the uh, university. <clears throat> we have a very rural campus for the undergraduate medical students. Here's another picture of that rural campus. And then this is our downtown campus in Center City, Philadelphia. And we use Hahnemann University Hospital as our teaching hospital. So Drexel University College of Medicine, at Hahnemann University Hospital. The use of percutaneous support devices is generally for uh, cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic shock is defined as a decreased cardiac output and evidence of tissue hypoperfusion in the presence of adequate filling pressures. We usually diagnose that with marked and persistent uh, hypotension with a blood pressure systolic of less than 90 for over 30 minutes, a reduction in the cardiac index of less than 2.2, and normal or elevated pulmonary capillary wedge pressure of about 15. Circulatory shock is diagnosed by poor tissue perfusion, which includes lab and clinical evaluation, suggesting oliguria, clouded sensorium, and cool modeled extremities. Despite all of our advances, cardiogenic shock has remained steady over time. In fact, it may be because of all our, of our advances. It may be that sicker patients are not dying right away, but are coming to the hospital presenting still in cardiogenic shock after ACLS or advanced uh, uh, measures. If you look over time, the uh, incidence of patients presenting with cardiogenic shock is about 7%. And that comes from a study of almost 300,000 patients presenting with STEMI or left uh, bundle branch block at hospitals that have on-site percutaneous coronary intervention to treat the ST elevation uh, MI. <clears throat> How do we treat patients with cardiogenic shock? First is medical therapy with pressors. Second is mechanical circulatory support devices. So therapy with inotropes, uh, the, the goal is to support blood pressure, keep the patients alive until they can have mechanical therapy with angioplasty or so forth. <clears throat> but inotropes themselves are deleterious. The increase of, uh, there is an increase of uh, oxygenation at a time of oxygen set starvation, which can increase lactic acid production. The tachycardia can decrease diastolic interval. There's a marked increase in left ventricular end diastolic pressure, which can decrease uh, diastolic perfusion pressure and increase wall tension. And tachycardia mediated apoptosis may decrease myocardial recovery. So if you look at outcomes, the more pressors that are used, the worse uh, the mortality from zero, one, two, three, and four. And again, it's unclear whether that's cause and effect or uh, delineating a high risk group of patients or really a combination of both. But clearly inotropes are not overly effective in treating cardiogenic shock. That takes us to mechanical support devices. The goals of percutaneous circulatory support depend upon the clinical application for cardiogenic shock, uh, MI, or decompensated heart failure, the goal, of course, is to normalize cardiac output, blood pressure, cardiac power output, decrease the wedge pressure, optimize blood oxygen saturation, enable bridge to decision making, minimize myocardial damage and optimize recovery, decrease myocardial work and oxygen consumption while optimizing myocardial perfusion. Really, there are two roles. One is for high-risk percutaneous coronary intervention or angioplasty and stenting, and the other is myocardial salvage in the setting of an acute myocardial infarction. <clears throat> the three main goals, cardio circulatory support with systemic perfusion. We can measure that by the mean arterial pressure, the lactate and the creatinine. Ventricular support with left ventricular and right ventricular unloading. We can measure that by the left ventricular end systolic pressure and end diastolic pressure and the aortic pulse pressure, also with uh, brain natriuretic peptide and ventricular tachycardia. 
coronary perfusion, mean arterial pressure minus the left ventricular end diastolic pressure, ST segment changes on the electrocardiogram, and cardiac uh, biomarkers. This is a picture of uh, Hahnemann University Hospital right in downtown uh, or center city, Philadelphia. So getting to our mechanical uh, circulatory support, we have four main devices. One is an interaortic balloon pump, uh, and that is a inflation of a helium-filled balloon in the descending aorta. It results in increased coronary perfusion and left ventricular afterload reduction. The second is an impeller device. The catheter is, a, in pla is placed in the left ventricle and an axial flow rotary blood pump continually withdraws blood from the left ventricle and ejects the blood into the ascending aorta and the device looks like a pigtail catheter. The third device is the tandem heart. It's a centrifugal pump that withdraws blood from the left atrium and ejects blood back into the arterial circulation via the femoral artery. And the last is ECMO, where venous blood is removed via a catheter placed in the inferior vena cava. Uh, a centrifugal pump then passes the blood over a membrane oxygenator before it's returning the oxygenated blood to the descending aorta. And what I'll do over the next uh, couple of slides is compare the four devices, and then I'll go over each device in a little bit more detail. This is the Impella device. It can increase uh, uh, cardiac flow by about a half a liter, so it's a relatively weak device. It's placed in the aorta. It can be placed for days. It's very easy to place. It goes in a seven or an eight French sheath. <clears throat> Femoral artery just has to be over four millimeters for a successful uh, placement. Uh, it does need cardiac synchrony or stable rhythm to work. It reduces afterload, increases the mean arterial pressure, increases coronary flow, cardiac power, decreases the end diastolic pressure and the wedge pressure, <clears throat> increases coronary perfusion, and decreases myocardial oxygen demand. Very easy device to put in, but it has modest improvement in coronary flow. The Impella device, there are three different kinds, Impella 2.5 or the CP, which can be placed percutaneously and the Impella 5 that's placed uh, surgically. It goes from the left ventricle into the aorta. It can be a maximum implant uh, of seven days. Oops, how do I go back? Can you go back one for me? Back one slide. Oh, there we go, thank you. It's very large, 13 or 14 French, uh, 21 French for the Impella 5, which is why it's surgically placed. The femoral artery has to be uh, larger. Uh, it does not need cardiac synchrony. It does reduce afterload, dramatically increases mean arterial pressure, coronary flow, cardiac power, reduces the end diastolic pressure, wedge pressure, preload, increases coronary perfusion, and decreases myocardial oxygen demand. The tandem heart uh, is placed through a, uh, a transeptal puncture. It can increase the cardiac output by five liters. It takes the blood from the left atrium and puts it into the aorta. 14 days implantation time. It's a very large device. Uh, the femoral artery has to be large, and it has very beneficial effects on uh, uh, hemodynamic parameters. And then VA ECMO also can dramatically increase coronary output. It takes blood from the right atrium or the inferior vena cava, places it into the aorta. It can be placed for weeks. Very large device. Needs a large femoral artery size does not need coronary synchrony, and has dramatic improvements in hemodynamic parameters. I think I'm going to skip this slide. It seems to be uh, very similar to what I just showed. And then how do we choose which device is best for which patient? The intraaortic balloon plump is good for patients that have preserved ejection fraction, who have uh, multivessel coronary disease. It can be used with aortic stenosis and mitral regurgitation. ECMO can, is good for profound hypoxemia since the blood is oxygenated uh, externally. It's good for cardiac arrest patients, sepsis, multi-organ failure. The tandem heart can be good for aortic regurgitation, profound hypoxemia. An impella device is good for cardiogenic shock, acute MI, high-risk angioplasty with low ejection fractions. So my next few slides will go over each device in a little bit more detail. Aortic counterpulsation with an interaortic balloon pump. The uh, pump is placed through the femoral artery and placed in the descending uh, aorta. 
It increases diastolic blood pressure and mean blood pressure, increases coronary perfusion, reduces systolic blood pressure, reduces afterload and wall tension. It can increase the cardiac index by about 40%, reduce lactate, uh, arterial lactate, and increase coronary blood flow. Uh, its benefit is that it's well known, it's been around for many years, it increases coronary perfusion, mild increase in cardiac output, very easy to place and it's inexpensive. Uh, it does require a minimum of cardiac function to be of any benefit, requires a stable rhythm or a paced rhythm, modest unloading, and the clinical data for an intraaortic balloon pump is relatively weak. Let's go over that clinical data. This is one, an intraaortic balloon pump for myocardial infarction with cardiogenic shock. And if you look at the data, there was no reduction in 30-day mortality, six-month mortality, or 12-month mortality. It didn't increase mortality, but wasn't particularly beneficial. What it can do, however, is be of assistance in stabilizing a patient as they're undergoing a coronary intervention. And that was showed by this clinical trial, the evidence for a balloon pump versus no balloon pump in high-risk PCI trial. And that was defined as impaired left ventricular function of less than 30% and uh, either a high jeopardy score or a target vessel supplying uh, a large greater than 40% of the myocardium. And if you look at the data of that, the balloon pump is in orange and no balloon pump is in blue. There was a dramatic reduction in procedural complications and a uh, trend to a reduction in six-month mortality. So although a balloon pump has no benefit just in shock, it can be beneficial to stabilize patients during high-risk angioplasty. This is the, probably the best tourist site in Philadelphia, right in Center City. It's Independence Hall, and it's the birthplace of uh, uh, the uh, Declaration of Independence and the beginning of a democracy in North America. Uh, very old for us, it's about uh, 250 years old. For us, that's incredibly old. What about the impella? <clears throat> it's a percutaneous left ventricular cyst device. It looks like a pigtailed catheter that pumps in blood from the left ventricle and ejects it into the aorta. And there are three types depending upon the size. This is what it looks like. Here's the device, the impella. It's then hooked up to the device that plugs into the console. It's a, uh, a rotating device that draws blood by spinning. This end is placed into the left ventricle. The blood inlet is here and this goes through the aortic valve into the aorta, and the blood outlet is there. Here's an example uh, in the ventricle, the pigtail in the apex of the ventricle, and the output above the aortic valve. Inserting the impella is a little bit uh, complicated. Usually we pre-close with two sutures because of the large size, uh, although when you do that, you can withdraw the device percutaneously and not need surgery to take out the device. We place a regular pigtail into the left ventricle, put in an 035 wire. We take out the 035 wire, put in an 018 wire, remove the catheter while leaving in the 018 wire with the curled tip, and then the device goes over and you position the catheter. Its indication in the United States for, by the uh, FDA is in high-risk uh, percutaneous coronary intervention, defined as an ejection fraction of less than 35%, and unprotected left main or the last remaining vessel. It cannot be placed over a mechanical uh, aortic valve, uh, aortic stenosis. AI is a relative contraindication, and you can't use it in patients with a severe peripheral vascular disease, although the surgeons can put one in surgically, really through the subclavian artery. The clinical data is uh, modest, the PROTECT-2 clinical trial. Patients requiring uh, hemodynamic support during uh, uh, angioplasty, in this case non-emergent, but a high-risk angioplasty, balloon pump versus an impella. The primary endpoint was 30-day, and then there was a follow-up endpoint at 90 days. These were very high-risk patients. The ejection fractions were very low, around 20%. Their syntax scores were low, and they were about two-thirds of them were not considered surgical candidates. The impella group had more rotational atherectomy use than the intraaortic balloon pump, and some people feel that that's a limitation of the uh, clinical trial. And the data showed a trend to benefit, impella in green, balloon pump in red, a trend to a benefit in the 30-day output uh, uh, endpoints, but a statistically significant uh, reduction in endpoints at 90 days, although that wasn't the primary endpoint of the clinical trial. 
So you can analyze this as you want, either negative because of a trend or positive with the secondary endpoint. So the conclusions is that it was safe and provided better hemodynamic support than balloon pumps, a trend towards a reduction at 30 days, a significant reduction at 90 days. In addition, the impella can be used as a bridge to cardiac transplantation, and in one of our monthly uh, uh, Drexel Cardiology and Sejong Cardio Cardiovascular Center, one of our presentations a year or two ago was of the use of a uh, uh, impella, smaller device than this trial, to support a patient before LVAD and transplant. But this is the best data that's out there. It's a very small trial, it's retrospective non-randomized study looking at impella 5 as a bridge to next therapy in a single center. 40 patients from the Baylor University Medical Center uh, had the impella placed, and the endpoint was survival to the next therapy. All patients were very high risk, low ejection fractions, uh, and they had the device placed with the intent of uh, bridge to transplant or bridge to left ventricular assist device. And the, output, the outcomes were good. Here's the bridge to transplant, 20. 75% had survival of the next therapy and 93% survival to discharge at 30 days of those. And the bridge to an LVAD, 75% survived to the next therapy and 87% of those uh, survived to discharge in 30 days. The hemodynamic parameters, and there are a lot of these here on this slide, were all beneficial in the impella group versus uh, balloon pump or no balloon pump. And of course, with the large device, there was an increase in bleeding transfusions. The limitations, small number of patients, retrospective non-randomized trial, but that's the best data there is for temporary support with the impella before a bridge to decision strategy. And I think this device in the United States is being used much more frequently as we're awaiting patients for LVAD or transplantation. This is a picture of one of the rivers that goes through Philadelphia. There are two, one on each side. This one's called the Schuylkill River, and it goes right along the west side of Center City, Philadelphia here. The next slide is a uh, VA ECMO, uh, and it takes blood uh, uh, from uh, the, uh, the uh, venous system, puts it through an oxygenator, returns it to the arterial system, and blood is drained from the right atrium or central veins, uh, oxygenated, and then returned into the arterial circulation. Why do we need it? For the support of heart and lung function, uh, bridge to long-term device, or bridge to uh, transplantation. Uh, really, it is used in the high-risk patients. So we consider ECMO when patients are 50% mortality risk, and we really strongly uh, recommend ECMO when there's an 80% mortality risk. Patients should have a reasonable chance of recovery before it's placed. And these are some of the reasons why we place uh, ECMO, graft failure, post-heart transplant, post-cardiotomy, cardi and cardiogenic shock. There's an inflow cannula that drains blood from the patient, pumps it through an oxygenator, heat exchanger, and then returns it to the patient. Um, this is the data for cardiogenic shock. There's not that much data. 200 patients with acute cardiogenic shock. Uh, 100 of those were post-cardiotomy. And using ECMO, uh, almost 60% of the patients survived. 23% were bridged to heart transplant and 35% uh, without a bridge to transplant or LVAD were weaned for recovery. This is data from the Extracorporal Life Support Organization. If you look at this line here, cardiac ECMO, 54% survived their uh, ECMO procedure, and of those, 39% survived a discharge or a transfer. The last device to describe is the tandem heart. Uh, it, it requires a uh, interatrial septal puncture, drains blood from the left atrium, and then uh, pumps it into the uh, aorta for five liters of uh, flow. This is what the pump device looks like. It's a centrifugal pump. The hemodynamic uh, effects are very good in patients with cardiogenic shock. It certainly increases cardiac index, and it lowers the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And if you look at uh, a randomized trial of the tandem heart versus a balloon pump, it does increase cardiac power. The clinical endpoints are lacking. It's hard to do clinical trials, so that it's a very effective device in hemodynamic support, but there's not a lot of endpoint data. 
This is uh, Philadelphia. This is the Art Museum, the major road going through it, which we call the Parkway. And Hahnemann is right over here, a uh, lo perfect location for Center City, Philadelphia. I think I'll take just two minutes to talk about right ventricular support device. We can use the Impella, ECMO, or the tandem right ventricular heart. RV failure, uh, about 9% of heart failure admissions, and the mortality with RV failure is almost 17%. We do invasive hemodynamic assessment, and there are many parameters that we can use to define RV dysfunction. Again, we can use pressors, and then there's mechanical support, right ventricular cyst device with a tandem heart impella or uh, ECMO. The most common one is an impella uh, RP. It does a uh, backwards blood flow, so we place it uh, uh, into the right ventricle and then it goes out the uh, pulmonary artery. The inflow takes the blood from the right ventricle and pumps it uh, out into the uh, pulmonary artery. This is what it looks like in position. There is one clinical trial showing its benefit called the Recover Right study. I don't have enough time to go into it in detail, but some of the patients were post-implantation of a durable VAD with then right heart failure. The others were post-MI or cardiotomy, uh, and the patients, uh, uh, a very low number of patients, 18 and 12, but compared to historical norms, they had increased uh, benefit uh, of flow by the device, their index went up and their CVP went down. And these are the outcomes and compared to historical norms, they seem to do uh, better at 30 day survival. So in conclusion, percutaneous RVADs have increased with at least three systems available. They can provide adequate support with limited complications. The timing and indications of RVADs are still not well uh, uh, defined. The Recover Right Prospective trial was positive, and there are, is a great need for more clinical trials to be done. So thank you very much for your attention. It's been an honor for me to attend the conference, and thank you very much.